good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you in our first webinar of Afran AKI and Critical Care Nephrology Working Group. Uh, before I start, I would like to express our deep prayers to our brothers in Morocco and Libya in their current catastrophes and, and deep consolations for all those who were affected by these catastrophes. Our aim in uh, this webinar is to, and this group really is to encourage and promote education, research, and training of this important field of kidney disease in Africa. So we will start and I will leave the floor and I am pleasure to have our two of our colleagues in Africa, Dr. Palawaziri from Nigeria and Dr. Vincent from Oima from Ghana to lead this session. Dr. Palawaziri is the current... Uh, uh, so good, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, wherever you are. I'm Dr. Palawaziri. So uh, we are starting with the first speaker with uh, Dr. Ahmed. She's from Tunisia. She graduated from uh, Faculty of Medicine from University of uh, Tunis. And uh, she was a former intern at the Daju University in France. She has obtained several diploma certificates and uh, from uh, specialist in nephrology from in March 2007. Dr. Amel also has certificate in statistical method and epidemiology from Faculty of Medicine. Uh, she is currently an associate professor of medicine at the University of Tunis in Tunisia. She is also an, elect, an elected member and deputy secretary general of the STNDT uh, Association. Uh, she is also the ref, referent to the STNDT Kidney and Metabolic uh, Disease Working Group. She is also a member of that uh, working group. And she's also a member of the LR00SPO1, Renal Pathology Research Laboratory, and also the, uh, the manager of that lab. Dr. Ahmed, you are welcome. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bala. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Is it okay? So, um, hi everyone. It's a pleasure for me to be with you today in this uh, first uh, webinar of the AK uh, Working Group. It's uh, a pleasure also for me to be part of this uh, working group. Uh, so, my lecture today will be about the role of uh, primary care in a kidney uh, injury and uh, to promote the, uh, the role of prevention, essentially, of uh, the uh, primary care physicians in the management of acute kidney injury. So, um, as you know, acute kidney injury is a sudden decrease in kidney function over a few days and hours uh, that result in the retention of uh, urea and nitrogenous waste and dysregulation of extracellular volume and electrolytes. So AKI is a major patient safety issue. It is a syndrome which is common, harmful, and hopefully uh, preventable. There is also a global variation in the incidence of AKI. As you see here, there is a variation among countries and regions, and AKI affects globally 13 million people per year. So why does it matter? Uh, in fact, AKI is associated with one in five emergency hospital admissions. It is associated with increased mortality in short and long term. It has poorer health outcomes. People are more likely to have more CKI at AKA, and it is associated with longer stance, uh, lengths of hospital stay and more need for, to hemodialysis and to intensive care units. So there is also a global variation in the incidence of this complication across cohorts and population. It's more frequent in critically ill patients and in patients with sepsis, which have the highest amount of mortality. 
So what about EKI in a community? Uh, in fact, many patients in community are at risk of EKI and most EKI occurs in community. Around two thirds of AKI cases identified in hospital develop in the community before hospitalization. As you see here in this study about the clinic characteristics and outcomes of community acquired acute kidney injury, uh, we saw that there is about 65% of cases that were in non nephrology consultations, uh, around 74% of cases that had stage AKI1, and there are more in more than half of cases uh, comorbidities such as diabetes and more than a half were undertaken nephrotoxic medications. There is also the data from the report by the National Confidential Inquiry into Patient Outcome and Death in the United Kingdom. This report uh, highlights the process of care of patients who died in hospital with a primary diagnosis of AKI. And the data from this report is that uh, about uh, AKI was avoidable in 14% of cases, only 50% of AKI care were considered good. There were poor assessment of risk factors and about 43% of post-admission AKI had an unacceptable delay in recognition. So this may indicate a lack of awareness of this inherited uh, risk of EKI amongst hospitalized patients, uh, a poor understanding also of the pathophysiology of this condition and uh, an inadequate knowledge of its management amongst medical staff. So it seems that primary care should have an important role in the management of EKI. Uh, because primary care professionals can play a significant role in early diagnosis, in treatment, and patient education. A greater emphasis on detecting AKI and managing it prior to refer can improve patient outcomes. And uh, considering that a large number of cases start to deteriorate before hospital admission, the ability to improve outcomes for a large number of patients is uh, also possible. So what would an excellent care of AKI in primary care deliver? For community-acquired AKI, it should be an early recognition, an appropriate treatment, refer and follow-up, and in hospital managed AKI, an appropriate post-discharge management. So how to manage AKI in primary care? First of all, they should identify the factors putting a patient at risk. They have a role of prevention, early detection, and correction of fluid status, and they should give an appropriate treatment when it is necessary. Here are the different risk factors for the development of AKI uh, about these factors. The practitioner should be aware of uh, this risk factor. There, there are uh, patient-specific factors such as increasing HCKG and diabetes, and there are also uh, specific situation risk like hypotension, sepsis, and post-operative. Uh, in addition, some medications are associated with risk of AKI, such as NSAIDs, uh, which are there are nephrotoxic, diuretics, uh, which can help can worsen hypovolemia, ACE inhibitors, also iodinated contrast agents, and certain antibiotics due to their toxicity or hypersensitivity. So what about the role of prevention? They should uh, provide nursing measures, maintaining normal blood volume, uh, give hemodynamic resuscitations before any surgical procedure, discontinue nephrotic drugs, and discuss the temporary discontinuation of ACE inhibitors when it is necessary, and uh, the dose adjustment, especially in the elderly. When initiation of ACE inhibitors, they should monitor creatinine serum and potassium within two to four weeks uh, after starting or changing dose. And if there is an increase in serum creatinine that exceeds 30%, they should review the causes of AKI, correct volume depletion, and reassess concomitant medication. And at last resort, they should reduce the dose or stop ACE inhibitors. Also, when prescribing iodinated contrast media, prevention must be applied in high-risk 
situations such as in diabetes, chronic renal failure, hypovolemia. Uh, before prescribing uh, uh, an hydrated contrast medium, uh, they should ensure that the patients are well hydrated and they should ensure volumic expansion by venous administration of saline or bicarbonated serum. Uh, also, there are the sick day rules for high risk patient groups. Uh, they should advise uh, some uh, some advices to these patients at risk. In fact, patients with the risk factor should be warned of the possibility of developing AKA if they became uh, acutely ill. They should be advised to increase their fluid intake and avoid any protoxic medication while ill. Second step is the recognition of AKI. AKI may be suspected from clinical presentation or detected by a rise in serum creatinine or a reduction in urine output. So they should check renal function uh, regularly in patients at risk of AKI or when they the presence with an intercurrent illness. Here are the different potential symptoms of AKI. They should aware, be aware of these symptoms like hypotension, uh, recent exposure to toxic insult, loin pain, and prostatic symptoms. The diagnosis of AKI is made according to the guidelines of KGGO, and it is based uh, on the increase of selenium creatinine and the decrease of urine output. So once AKI identified, they should identify the causes. There are many causes for AKI. In most cases, it occurs as part of, of an episode of an acute illness. So they should rule out for the obvious causes of acute kidney injury. They should eliminate uh, 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 dehydration uh, in this, this patient, and they should perform a renal ultrasound to uh, verify if uh, there isn't a dilatation in the extractory tract. Uh, what about the management? Uh, an appropriate management of clinically stable patients with AKI stage 1-2 can be undertaken in primary care. So how to treat in community? They should advise uh, oral rehydration. Uh, they should ad adjust drugs, monitor blood pressure, uh, catheter if uh, there is an obstruction and repeat creatinine. Uh, also, they should stop nephrotoxins. If low blood pressure, stop anti hypertensives If dehydration, stop diuretics. Avoid usual opioids and stop metformin if AKA is stage 2-3. There are also some red flag signs that should be aware, and in front of these signs, they should refer earlier the patients to the specialist. Uh, when there is stage 3 AKA, when AKA is with an NK cause or not improving, when there are an adequate response to treatment, uh, when uh, there is a uh, suspected diagnosis that may need special treatment, or if there are complications such as hyperkalemia, fluid overload, of, uh, or if uh, AKI occurs in real transplant. What about post AKI care? After an episode of AKI, they should review patients to advise on an appropriate management and reduction of any medications that were withheld during an AKI episode and to screen also for CKD. Uh, there are factors that determine the urgency of review that include the cause of the AKI, its severity, and the degree of kidney recovery following AKI. Here are the different key elements of post ke care, care that include optimizing medicine management, coordinating monitoring of kidney function, and communication kidney health and AKI risk with patients and carers. What about optimizing conditions management? They uh, should restart drugs uh, with prognostic benefit following AKI, as a failure to do so can result in avoidable patient harm. Medication review post AKA may also provide opportunities to minimize polypharmacy and stop the use uh, of NSAIDs unless there is a compelling need. 
Uh, what about coordinating monitoring of kidney function? In fact, the risk of developing a new or worsening CKG is higher if kidney function remains below pre-AK uh, baseline. Uh, if AKI is a severe of, or there are repeated AKI episodes, and if there are other risk factors for CKG. So it is recommended evaluating a patient's kidney function three months after an episode of AKI to check for new onset, worsening, or pre-existing CKG. Early, earlier monitoring should be made if uh, serum creatinine has not returned to a patient's pre-AKI baseline. So check kidney function by blood test and urine test. About communicating kidney health and AKI risk with patients and carers, in fact, the generating an agreed passion action plan with patients may help ensure timely review of medication and kidney monitoring, as well as support management of future episodes of acute illness. What are the strategies to expedite AKA recognition and response by promoting uh, AKA awareness and risk reduction strategies among patients and healthcare staff? Because AKA often begins without symptoms specific to AKA, by maintaining a low threshold to perform blood tests to check kidney function if at risk patients become unwell, and by timely review of patients whose blood results trigger AKA warning stage alerts in order to interpret the test result in clinical context. Uh, primary care professionals should have also regular teaching on AKA. Uh, in fact, since the report, the NCPOD report demonstrated that poor management of AKA was most commonly the result of poor clinical care rather than an organizational issues, it is essential then that all doctors, regardless of grade and specialty, should receive regular teaching on AKA. It is recommended that is occur at trust induction for foundation year trainees and subsequently for core medical and general practitioner. Such teaching could be delivered through lectures, tutorials, and simulation-based learning. So in summary, uh, actually AKI is recognized as being associated with poor health outcomes and with the emergency evidence that a significant proportion of cases may be avoidable, there is a growing need to invest in the implementation and evaluation of strategies designed to improve the prevention and management of AKA in primary care. Uh, in fact, primary AKI is not a specialist emergency. It is seen commonly in acute medicine, and as such, it is essential that all physicians have the confidence and skill to identify and manage it. And if I have to answer to the question of the role of primary care in AKI, I think they should have the role of review, help, and refer on time the patients to the specialist. And the essential role is the prevention, because prevention is better than cure. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Anil. Thank you. For your very interesting lecture. Thank you, Dr. Palat, for introducing Professor Amal, and we'll work with the questions later on. I uh, would like to introduce first Professor Bala, who introduced Dr. Amal, which we missed in the first. He is the Chief Medical Director, IBB uh, Specialist Hospital in MENA, Nigeria. He is the Chair of Human Research Committee in the hospital, and he is the Chair of IBB Kidney Foundation in Nigeria, and the last winner of the search. A winner, uh, second prize winner of the ISN Clinical Research Award in the last World Congress of Nephrology. So, uh, our uh, next moderator, uh, uh, Professor Ala, uh, Professor Vansom Poima, who will introduce the second speaker. Professor Poima is the Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Ghana Medical School. He is the head of Nephrology Unit and Department of Medicine in the university, and he's a deputy chair currently of the Renal Registry of the AFRA. He has many and over 60 publications, peer review journals, and principal investigators in many grants and uh, in many grants. So please, Professor Boima, introduce our 
Next speaker, Professor Minon. Thank you, Professor Yasa. It's a privilege to be introducing Professor Minon this time. Uh, she wants very little to be said about her, but she should permit me to say a few uh, for now. She has um, an MBC uh, degree, Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery, and also a diploma in Child Health, and diploma in Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and also fellow Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, and fellow co uh, uh, College of uh, uh, Physicians. She's a full professor and head of Clinical Unit of Pediatric Nephrology and Solid Organ Transplantation at Red Cross War Memorial Children's Hospital, and a senior lecturer at the University of Cape Town. I'll skip a few things just to obey her wishes and say a few things that I will put her later into context. She is a nephrologist and a pediatric intensive care consultant and on seven young child uh, steering committee. She had interest in the care of critically ill uh, children who have acute kidney injury requiring dialysis and transplantation. And so she's well placed and she's the best person to take us through this topic regarding KRT in pediatric critical uh, in pediatric critical care settings. And she, that one thing that excites me most about her she's, is that she said she's an amateur surfer. Obviously, we are going to go on a surfing journey with her through this topic. And trust me, she's not an amateur on this topic. She's a, a renowned and a qualified person to deliver on this one. So Prof Minon, you're welcome to take us through. Thank you very much, Vincent, for a lovely uh, introduction. And I'm really delighted to follow the first speaker because she's done a lot of my introduction work already. Um, I'm going to be speaking about um, acute kidney injury in an ICU setting. And I just want to promote the Kenyan Renal Congress, which is happening next week. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be there, but you can just see what a wonderful time I had. And so in terms of AFRAN and AFNA collaboration, I would really encourage people to go to that. So we've spoken a bit about acute kidney injury in pediatrics. It used to be acute renal failure. We know in children, it's often fluid-related shock and sepsis. Often there's drug toxicity, but no monitoring of minor glycosides. And we just have freezamide and hope for the best. And often it's public health related issues such as clean water, diarrhea and vomiting. And we know in children, there's no easy dialysis. So we use the Cadigo um, classification as you do, urine output on the one side, serum creatinine, but the problem there is what is your baseline? So we use the Kdigo for children as well. And even for neonates, we now have a neonatal AKI definition, which is very similar to that last one. We've mentioned earlier that prevention is better than cure. Um, and this is a mignon, so it's a self-portrait. Uh, and we know that conservative therapy, we try not to allow fluid overload. We use fruzamide a lot, either as a single dose or as an infusion. We've done some local research recently um, published by Beatrice Nyan from Ghana showing aminophilin making a comeback, either as a single dose or a six hourly dose. And we try and avoid nephrotoxic agents as best we can. The role of fluid after admission, make sure you don't fluid overload your patient. And so we've seen that if you are more than 20% fluid overloaded at the time of CRRT initiation, um, you're going to be in trouble. And this is a nice, easy um, formula from Stuart Goldstein. And this picture shows it well. If you are using a lot of fluid for resuscitation and you then continue with a lot of fluid for maintenance or homeostasis, you will end up having to spend a lot of time removing that fluid by CRT or KRT. So in children, we know there's lots of challenges for access. We're very lucky to get this paper into Nature Reviews, just explaining what tough time children do have. And we know that for CRT or KRT, as it's called now, you can either use peritoneal dialysis or CVVHD in an ICU setting. Increasingly, there are better machines and better lines, also better hemodialysis catheters. Many of the children have metabolic conditions, and we, at, in our unit in Cape Town, hold the record in, in our region for having a few children who has been as low as 1.7 kilograms when they've had KRT. So just starting with hemofiltration, the ABC guide would be your vascular access, blood pumps, equipment circuits, your dialysis prescription, replacement solutions, filters, and then anticoagulation. 
For me, the biggest issue, and again, this is a self-portrait of me, is the vascular access. It's the biggest problem. Inexperienced people should use a femoral line, but that does give children problems because they can't walk around with the femoral line. So for us, the best option is an internal jugular line put in under ultrasound guidance. I would caution against subclavian lines as they can cause lung puncture. And if you're very small, less than three kilograms, you may need to put in two single lumen lines. This is just a nice slide of what is available currently in South Africa. So also in Africa, it does get imported from overseas. So an arrow, five French, five centimeters, not a triple lumen, a double lumen, because you can see 20 gauge and 18 gauge. Um, America has a six French bard. We have a Gamcat, a 6.5 French, and then Medcamp and Arrow make seven, eight, and nine. So those that's a really nice vascular access guide. Here you can see a picture of such a line into a patient's neck. It's a double lumen, six, uh, five French, but you can see even in a small baby, this looks to be enormous. Uh, the Fresenius Multifiltrate is the machine we use, but you can see the machine is many times bigger than the actual little baby. I sometimes wonder if it'd be easier if we put the baby on the on the scales. Um, but what has happened in my sort of career in the last 20 years is we now have pediatric lines. We also have pediatric filters and circuits. So that's made life a lot easier. So the prescription is we, if you putting less more than 10% uh, of your blood volume outside of the child, you need a blood prime. We use mils per kilograms for the blood pump speed. For the dialysis flow rate, 25 mils per kilo per hour. And we would start off realistically with taking off one to two mils per kilo per hour of ultrafiltration if you need to get rid of fluid and you can go up to five fairly safely. So this is a nice summary just to be aware of. I've mentioned the blood flow. I've mentioned the dialysis flow rate. These are the priming volumes. If you've got smaller um, circuits, these are the line priming volumes. And then importantly, we use heparin. Citrate is not yet licensed for children in Africa. Um, so we tend to use either a bolus of heparin or we run an infusion. So those are our little uh pearls of wisdom which I'm happy to share with you if you want to write to me um, and that is what we use. More recently we've had the Carpa Diem which is a machine out of Italy licensed for children between two and ten kilograms. Um, it's a tricky machine. Um, you can see here we've got a small baby on it. This is a whole team of people that we got together when we started using it in the first place so it is very efficient. It's extremely sensitive not the easiest machine to run and I think at the moment we are currently the only center in Africa running with such a machine. But importantly uh, there was an international pediatric dialysis survey you can see many countries around the world were not really included in this but what is really important is that peritoneal dialysis for children is available in all centers. Whether you're in a developed or a developing country I'm going to call that a well-resourced or less well-resourced country. And you can see here whether you are working in a poorer area or a better resourced area, PD is available in 100%. Even KRT or CRT in well-developed countries or well-resourced countries is only available in 60%. So for us, it's good news that PD is available. Um, the gold standard would be if you've got a child with AKI who you are not winning with conservative methods to try and attempt to move the child to a pediatric renal center and get a Tenkoff catheter placed. But if you can't do that, then do a bedside PD catheter. And if you've done an ascites tap, then you can do that. So picture of a little PD catheter into a person. This is a surgical patient who's had a neckline and a formal surgical tank off that takes a lot more time and effort. <clears throat> this is a picture from the Philippines where somebody has used an adult central line as a PD catheter in a little premature baby and this is what we're teaching. We use manual dialysis with burotrols and a, um, a Y connector. You can get a closed system but you can also make this up yourself. Um, and when you say low tech or high tech, this is a child who's had cardiac surgery, an oscillator, a nitric oxide, many infusion pumps, but also 
PD um, in situ, which is something that's even happening in some of the well-resourced countries in small cardiac babies. So this is a picture of a PD catheter. We're using a home choice um, cycling machine to save our nurses for anybody over five kilograms. So it doesn't have to be low tech. We're currently doing an audit of over 500 cases of bedside catheters that we've inserted over the last 20 years. Um, and our survival rate is running in the region of 60%, which if you were considering maybe all those children might die, that's actually not bad going. What's been the changes in my practice? A three-way tap, you can improvise anything in a bureau trial. If you've got those two devices, you can do a lot. Uh, we've taught how to make fluid for dialysis using Ringer's lactate, adding 50% dextrose, and then you actually get the dialysis fluid concentrations that you are familiar with. People are concerned about the potassium in Ringer's lactate, but that does not show to be a problem, and we've done quite a lot of studies on that. We've actually also published in our own center, people are concerned about peritonitis. We've only had 4% peritonitis using locally prepared fluid, and that's because we take theater to the bedside so we use everything in a very sterile met method and we actually mix up our fluid in a sterile technique so COVID taught us about PPE and being very good about wearing sterile gear so if you've got nothing else you may want to use some ringers lactate a three-way tap we've even seen people using nasogastric tubes with extra holes in it and then a drainage bag as well so you can actually improvise. And what's really helped us a lot in terms of teaching improvisation is saving young lives. We started off just for children, but we are now doing saving older lives as well. And so we actually teach about adult acute um, kidney injury as well. So this is a, a group of um, companies. So ISN, IPNA, um, ISPD, but also SFND and the Asian Society of uh, Nephrology. We've all clubbed together to um, work together. This is the steering committee. And here you can see some of our regional advisors. Many of you may be part of this. And what we do is we've actually taught people about acute kidney injury using peritoneal dialysis. We've managed over 500 patients with a 65% survival rate. That is adults and children, and we try and te teach teams of doctors and nurses, so not just doctors on their own. This was on the front page of a journal, just showing um, how we're teaching teams of people to work together. So people come to us for a one-week course. We teach ICU, we teach PD, we teach vascular access, we even teach how to resuscitate somebody. And we've recently had one of these courses. So as I mentioned before, if you've got no other device, you can use an adult central line as a PD catheter. Samson Antwi from Ghana has taught many medical officers in the peripheries how to do PD and save lives. If you don't have that, we've also taught how to use a stick catheter or even an arrow um, uh, cavity drainage catheter as well. So any device, even chest drains have been used. We've taught saving young lives all over Africa. There have been lots of challenges. This is from one of our adult colleagues in the Cameroon who've also shown how they've made local fluid because professional fluid is too expensive. These are all the delegates that we've now trained in saving young lives. You can see it started in Africa, but it's moved right across the rest of the world. And this is a paper that's about to be submitted for publication. Our most recent Saving Young Lives course at the end of July, we had 45 people. We had 20 teams of doctors and nurses, adults and pediatrics from all over Africa. This is a very important paper to keep in mind. So if you want to take a photo of this, this is the guidelines for AKI. Um, Pete Norse was the primary author on this, on pediatrics, and Brett um, Cullis did the one for adults. It's got all the recipes and all the guidelines on how to manage AKI in a well-resourced setting, but also in a poorly resourced setting. So conclusions, horizons are shifting, including adults and neonates. More importantly, we've now got newer machines that have got um, proper facilities and equipment for smaller children. But what I'm going to advise you is to do what you're good at. Give your drugs as soon as possible. Start PD and don't waste time. Get those lines in. If you're going to do hemodialysis or CVVH, try and use high flow or transfer to a center who's good at it. But my take home message is prevention is the first priority as our previous speaker said. I feel that no patient with acute kidney injury should die without an attempt of PD. 
even using homemade fluid and improvised catheters. We need to think about African solutions for African problems. To quote Bashir Admani from Kenya, you can make a difference wherever you are. And just to say a big thank you to my colleagues who I work with at Red Cross and also for the Saving Young Lives organization. Um, this is really good news for Africa. And these are some of the fellows that we've actually trained over the many years. And thanks specifically to my two colleagues, Peter Norse and Ashton Kutsia. Thank you for your time and for listening to me. Thank, thank you, Professor Vignon Lili, for this very interesting and comprehensive lecture. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Dr. Pala, we have uh, some questions for uh, Dr. Amal. I think you can go through, please. Dr. Dr. Waziri, please. So, Dr. Dr. Amal, there is a question: uh, initiation of renal replacement therapy uh, early or late? The usual dilemma. What's your opinion in this dilemma? Uh, thank you for this question. It is uh, uh, pertinent. In fact, uh, the initiation depends on the indication and on the patient's clinical status. It is still controversial uh, to initiate late or early dialysis. Many studies had demonstrated that early initiation uh, actually does not provide a mortality benefit. So uh, I think uh, that uh, that uh, will depend essentially on the patient's uh, clinical states and, uh, and the uh, urgency of the indications. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the other question is about uh, uh, if you have any idea about the role of um, aminofullin in AKI. So that's being used quite a lot in neonates specifically, but it's also yes. making a comeback um, in in bigger patients. And if you look up Nyan, N-Y-A-N-N, -N, Beatrice, what we love about our trainees is that they actually do practical clinical research. So she's from Ghana, so hats off to Ghana. Um, she looked at the patients at Red Cross uh, and used in combination with Lasix, aminophilin is a really good diuretic as well. So if you're stuck, you've used some fruzamide, you don't have any dialysis facilities available, we would recommend using some aminophilin, uh, one milligram per kilo per dose six hourly as well as an additional diuretic. Additional to loop diuretics, huh? Additional to loop diuretics. Okay. Uh, any comment, Dr. Prof, uh, sir, uh, yeah, Prof, thank you very much for a nice lecture. I really enjoyed your lecture. Uh, I have a question on the use of diuretics in acute kidney injury. What are your thoughts regarding the use of diuretics in acute kidney injury? So if you look at highly resourced countries, when they compare the use of diuretics to not diuretics, at the end of the day, the outcome may be similar if you have lots of facilities to do dialysis. We know in our centers that dialysis can be difficult. I'm going to be cheeky and say, even in adults, it can be difficult to, to do dialysis. And I know during COVID, I was actually contacted by some adult nephrology colleagues from London who said they'd run out of machines. Could we remind them how to use acute PD? And the good news about diuretics is that you can make a patient who is completely anuric pass at least some urine. And we all know that somebody who is passing some urine, even if it's not a lot, is easier to manage than somebody who is completely anuric and fluid overloaded. So for us, I think there's definitely a role for a diuretic. What I'm going to just caution is that you don't give a large volume of fluid. So some people give a liter of fluid in an attempt to make the fruzamide work. For me, that doesn't work because part of the problem is you fluid overloaded. So fluid restriction is really important if your patient is fluid overload. And I think if it doesn't work, if you've done a trial of fruzamide, I wouldn't continue to use it because you can just make somebody diff. So we often give them a trial of fruzamide. If it works, great. If it doesn't work, we would actually stop and then consider dialysis. But you can get away without dialyzing if you actually fluid restrict somebody quite tightly um, if they are fluid overloaded and passing a little bit of urine. So there are a few little practical t tricks and tips that people can actually use. I'm not saying fruzamide is going to save your, your bacon every time, but it can be a very useful drug to use if you are stuck in a situation with acute kidney injury. Right. 
Thank you very much. I saw it's been a, a fight between the ICU critical care people and the nephrology. As well, I'm sure you are very much aware of this. So that's why I asked the question to get your opinion on this. And thank you very much for your answer. Excuse me to move uh, before we move to the next speaker uh, to ask some a uh, question or two, please, Professor Mignot. Uh, do you used to use the fusimide first? You said uh, you start by uh, bolus or uh, infusion. So we would often start with a bolus, and if that works, we may actually start an infusion. Um, I think with the infusion, yes, just be like careful that. not to use too much. So. For me, I think once you've gone to one milligram per kilo per hour, I don't think it works if you give a higher dose. So some people give two milligram per kilo per hour, or even five milligram per kilo per hour. That for me doesn't work as well. We would try and keep it running at one milligram per kilo per hour. So, sure. but um, we try at all costs not to dialyze unless we have to, because some of our children are very small. Um, as mm. I've shown you, I think our smallest child who had peritoneal dialysis was 800 grams. So a really small premature baby. Um, and if you've got that situation, you need to look. We don't dialyze for a high urea or creatinine. We dialyze for a high potassium, severe acidosis, and fluid overload. And with those three features, um, if you can get away with getting some diuretic and fluid restriction, you may not have to dialyze if your potassium is okay and you're not fluid overloaded. And then I see somebody's just put in the chat, what's the commonest cause of AKI in South Africa? I think it depends on where you work. I think sepsis and diarrheal disease has still got to be pretty serious. I know in northern parts of, of southern Africa, you've got to worry about malaria as well. In our center, we do quite a lot of cardiac trans uh, cardiac surgery. And so cardiac patients also run into trouble. So I think it just depends on where you work. But I think dirty water, diarrhea, and sepsis have got to be top of the pops. My last question about you said that you are, you have no citrate uh, as anticoagulation in CRRD. Do not use citrate. I'm right or correct me. So what's what's you do uh, in this situation of heparin use heparin. Sorry. Yeah. Heparin, so we for use heparin. Yeah. So we heparin. use heparin. Citrate is not actually licensed for children in South Africa. Now you could say most of the drugs we use is not licensed or are not licensed. Hmm. Um. But citrate is really quite tricky to manage. I'm not sure how comfortable you are with citrate, but we found citrate quite tricky. Um, and so for, for now, we are still using heparin. Hopefully in time, citrate will be easier for KRT. Um, but at the moment, we are still using heparin. And we monitor bedside ACTs uh, rather than waiting for the laboratory to do PTTs. But bedside ACTs and heparin are much easier um, than actually running citrate. So in bleeding conditions, you uh, usually do heparin free CRRT or something, or what you would do? Well, we normally need a little bit of a heparin bolus just to keep the lines uh, from clotting. And that's why we then use oh, beds at ACT. So we run the ACT, you know, somewhere between 180 and 220, and then we adjust the heparin infusion according to that. So even with coagulation problems and bleeding problems, we've, we've managed with ma monitoring the um, ACT very closely. Thank you so much. And let me move to the next speaker, case presentation in the usual real cases by uh, Dr. Nihari Nkita from Senegal. She is a nephrologist, hospital practitioner in nephrology department of the Center National Hospital, Dalal Jam in Dakar, Senegal. And she is the teaching assistant at the Department of Nephrology, Faculty of Medicine and Pharmacology. And she is now currently the deputy chair of Afran uh, Social Media Committee. Uh, so please, Professor Yarin, sh sh share your uh, screen, please, Dr. Yarin. Dr. Kita, please. Share your screen, please. Will be a real life case from Dr. Kita. Can you see? <clears throat> Dr. Yasser? Yes. Can you see my Yes, yes, slide? we can see. Oh, yes, okay. yes. Yes, full screen, please. Uh, go on, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Yasser. Uh, 
for uh, this kind of introduction. And uh, thank you, everyone, to, to join us in this in this first webinar of our working group. Uh, I'm uh, glad to 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 share with you in this webinar. Uh, first, uh, uh, my apologies for my English level, and uh, uh, I am going to to share with you. Uh, a clinical case uh, about uh, a young patient. Uh, we have a young um, 24 years old male who presented with an, uh, a palpitation with, with palpitations, uh, chest pain and shortness of, uh, of breath. Uh, the patient uh, presented to the emergency department with uh, palpitations burning in the chest and a sensation of difficult breathing in onset of few hours. Uh, two days before admission, he had complaint of vomiting uh, without diarrhea and, and fever. He has a, a sickle cell trait, uh, but uh, he, he didn't uh, have uh, any symptom about that. Uh, in uh, his uh, past history, he, 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 and he, the no kidney disease and no ongoing uh, pharmacological treatment. On the physical assessment, he had a um, small briefing and his uh, autosats uh, were low at. He had arrhythmia and a mitral stenosis murmur. Uh, her blood pressure was elevated and her heart rate, and he there was an uh, anuria, and the urine dipstick uh, show protein and and blood. Blood uh, test uh, revealed the elevated uh, urea and, uh, and creatinine, and the creatinine at ele elevated at uh, five uh, five thousand and sixty four mg per liter, with an hyperkalemia, a major hyperkalemia, and uh, his uh, alkali reserve is uh, was was very dropped at uh, six mm per liter. The electrocardiogram found an uh, irregular rhythm, uh, which is compatible with an atrial fibrillation, and the uh, renal ultrasound uh, sh showed uh, not uh, an hydronephrosis. The, the right kidney uh, was normal, and uh, the left kidney was very small with a poorly differentiation. So we conclude at uh, at first time to an AKI with an anuria and severe hyperkalemia and a severe metabolic acidosis among a patient with an asymmetry of length of kidney. There was a life threatening indication of a dialysis, and we do that. And after the patient uh, suddenly had a blood pressure drop and uh, a persistence of chest pain and palpitation. The kalemia became normal, and the electrocardiogram show an atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. We performed a cardiac ultrasound, and we diagnosed a rheumatic mitral valve stenosis and an important dilatation of right atrium. Uh, the patient was uh, admitted in uh, on a cardiac uh, intensive care unit uh, for an rhythmic collapse, and the uh, rapid uh, atrial fibrillation was uh, has been reduced by uh, external electric shock and digoxin, and the ry rhythm uh, became normal. But uh, when we we uh, stop uh, digoxin, uh, the the the, the Atrial fibrillation restart. And so we introduce uh, bisoprolol 
and uh, and anticoagulation, and we conclude to a paroxysmal uh, atrial fibrillation. The dynamic was stable on following days, but uh, the functions they fail, and we continue hemodialysis session. So further investigation was done in order to find uh, what causes uh, AKI among this patient, because uh, it's uh, very important to de determine the cause to properly treat uh, AKI. It uh, could be uh, uh, a cardiorenal syndrome or a post-streptococcal uh, glomerulonephritis or a renal vascular thrombosis. When we look uh, the, the past and current uh, medical history of uh, of autoimmunity or serology were negative and the lactate dehydrogenase was very, very elevated uh, at uh, 1,909. We performed a, a renal Doppler and the right kidney ha had a hyperechoic cortex uh, a reduced cortical perfusion and a decreased demonstration of intrarenal blood vessel. The left the kidney was small and, and avascular, and there were no thrombosis. Uh, MRI uh, was not performed because it was uh, expensive for the patient. And we discussed about uh, this case uh, with uh, cardiologist and vascular surgeon. Uh, on on, uh, on on meeting uh, of uh, the French uh, speakers vascular access society in Dakar, and uh, we deeply investigate with uh, echo, with ultrasound and Doppler, and we return finally a renal cortical uh, necrosis, and uh, it's which probably affected the left kidney uh, previously, and when we uh, perform a transesophageal echocardiogram, we found a thrombus. In the left, on the left atrium. Finally, we uh, we diagnosed a renal cortical necrosis from an embolic origi origin among patients with rheumatic mitral valve stenosis, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, and thrombus in the left atrium. Uh, the management of this patient was uh, um, uh, and anticoagulation. And uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, he continued hemodialysis. In conclusion, renal cortical necrosis is uh, not a frequent cause of AKI, but uh, uh, it uh, has a major cause of severe AKI because uh, in this situation, the AKI imme immediately uh, lead to 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 hand renal hand stage renal disease, and it's uh, a, a very bad uh, outcomes, a very bad uh, renal outcomes. Uh, we have to think about it, even no obstetric context, uh, mainly when uh, our patient or the patient uh, have a thromboembolism risk factor. Uh, that's my light, uh, last slide. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think, uh, so I said PS Prof was Dr. Vivian or is it? Dr. Uh, Keita, thank you for a wonderful presentation. It's like Yasser is off. Okay. Hello? Hello? Prof Yasser? Yes, Dr. No, Yasser I... is dropped off. Dropped if you can off. take okay. over, so, please. So I think uh, we may uh, allow room for uh, questions and comments. Uh, I think the floor is now open. Maybe we'll also look at our chat uh, message boxes to see if there are questions there for the speakers. Okay, Yasser is back. Yeah. Prof Yasser. Thank Prof you. Yasser. Sorry, I also went to my network got disconnected. Uh, hello. Yes, 
sorry sorry for it. sorry for this okay uh, thank you uh, dr for this uh, interesting case my question you, you uh, i have a question for you before we go to the chat uh, you said that you depended on the piece of roller and the uh, uh, dioxin for treatment of af huh yes i'm right or correct me if i'm wrong Yes, can you hear me? We maintained the rhythm with bisoprolon, uh, yes. Yes, and you didn't go to amiodarone? Initially, we uh, used digoxin in IV digoxin, and we introduced uh, bisoprolon. We uh, discussed with a cardiologist about uh, amiodarone, but uh, there were they were some restriction because of huh. the, the, the the function of this patient is is okay. failure and we have uh, we have, an, we have not uh, antidote of uh, amiodarone if uh, some if something uh, have arrived okay but uh, uh, but with bisoprolol the the rhythm became normal and uh, we we uh, we follow the patient uh, with cardiologist saying it's okay yes okay thank you uh, from uh, i have a comment about the relation between sickle cell trait and fsgs especially ldh is very high from the uh, Dr. Waziri, do you have a, com a comment? Hello. 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 Do you have any comment for this case, Dr. Waziri? Oh, no, no. Uh, no, 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 really. No. Okay. I think that just allow the participants to ask their questions. Uh, we we, we have we have just a comment about the relation between FSGS and sickle cell trait, which we would consider for this case. But I think uh, the the acute uh, state uh, of this case is somewhat uh, apart from FSGS condition. Uh, any comment from the professor Minio? So. So okay. sorry, I'm just trying to just read your question. So are we asking if sickle cell has got FSGS as yes. a secondary effect? Yes. That's a tricky, that's a tricky question. Um, I think there was quite a lot of insult also to to this um kidney that could actually on its own have caused trouble without the um mm -hmm. without it just being the sickle cell. Um and FSGS, so we don't see that much sickle cell in our setting. So I think there are some people on the line who see much more sickle cell than we do. Um, but you, yeah. you, FSGS can coexist with this. Um, but I think there's enough other evidence for acute kidney injury for it not just to be sickle cell on its own. Uh, thank you. I, I think I agree with Prof. Mignon. Uh, there's more a lot more uh, precipitant of acute kidney injury here to suspect that this patient has an acute kidney injury, which may have led to the particular necrosis. There may have been a background FSDS, perhaps from the sickle cell, or we don't know that for sure. It's just a presumption for now. Uh, um, so I think there's another question, so sickle cell trait in FSDS, probably it's more of sickle cell disease in FSDS and not sickle cell trait in FSDS. Uh, Largely for now, I mean, most of the data on sickle cell trait and CKD is still not, 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 not conclusive, apart from the ones we know in terms of uh, symptomatic hematuria, concentration problems, etc. Um, yeah, so that's what I want to say. Okay. Uh, and the acute condition will be vascular occlusion for this sickle cell. And thank you for your experiences. Another question. The high LDL in the case tissue ischemia and infarction and supports cortical necrosis. I have a comment from Dr. Yazid about this high LDL that it was a clue for uh, 
cortical necrosis in this case. Uh, no more questions and no more comments. And excuse me, Dr. Waziri, Dr. Tabasamino, for Dr. Dr. Boima to uh, close this meeting. And thank you for your very interesting topics, Dr. Anand. Professor Mignot, and for the interesting nice case presentation, very nice case presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Yanin, and thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good thank evening. You. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Paul. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, thank everyone. You. Sorry, uh, <laughs> Prof. Yasser, my network was unstable. I how I, I don't know what happened. You know, I keep logging with different. Uh, uh, no, no. <laughs> No problem, dear. No problem. Sorry. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.